Pleasant morning. Thank you so much for joining us in the studios of ABS Television, ABS Radio, and welcome to our online audience. Time now for another post-Cabinet media briefing, Cabinet having met yesterday, and with us as usual on a Thursday morning to unpack the developments out of the Cabinet meeting the previous day, the Minister for Information, Honorable Melford Nicholas, and the Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister's Office, Ambassador Lionel Hurst. Just on a quick programming note for our radio audience and our online audience, normally at this time of, in terms of the morning, for a weekday, we have Sports Beat. It comes up right after the cabinet briefing with uh, Sharif Sargent and Akila Hill House. What about a uh, little after 10 o'clock this morning? So tune in for that. Over to both gentlemen without any further ado. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Burford. Uh, the cabinet met yesterday and absent from the cabinet was the Prime Minister. Uh, it is not unusual, although under the Honorable Lester Bird, whenever he was absent, uh, no cabinet meeting was held. Uh, Prime Minister Gaston Brown has reversed that policy and ensured that whenever he is absent that the business of the government continues. Uh, it's leadership at its best. And uh, this morning, uh, the Honorable Melford Nicholas will, of course, share with uh, the audience uh, the kinds of decision making which took place yesterday. Minister Nicholas. Yes, uh, good morning. And uh, good morning to all of the audiences, uh, especially those who are joining us via uh, the various technology platforms that each of the media houses here present uh, provide for their listening and viewing audiences. Uh, yesterday's cabinet meeting uh, would have concerned itself with uh, two major issues, um, well, let's say three major issues, and I will give at the start of this uh, briefing uh, just some headlights uh, in terms of what would have transpired. Um, certainly, we would have delved into the whole matter of COVID. Um, you would recall that last week we did give an indication of a, a timeline in respect of some of the proposed uh, policy changes that the government had in mind leading to the Christmas celebrations. Uh, we would have had to review that timeline and some of those policy decisions in keeping with the increased uh, challenges that is coming with the um, outbreak of the Omicron variant. As a result of, of that uh, situation uh, re regarding Omicron and its, its potential spread globally, uh, the Cabinet has taken the decision that whereas we had up until last week made a determination that as of the 15th of this month that we would uh, permit entry into the country from vaccinated persons, fully vaccinated persons only, uh, whether, they not be, whether or not they were visitors or residents returning or citizens returning, fully vaccinated persons um, with uh, a PCR test. And of course, we would have had a panel of uh, rapid tests as well, antigen tests that we were going to permit. Um, we have, in consideration of what I mentioned earlier, made a determination that as of the 8th of this month, uh, we will permit only vaccinated persons with a PCR test not later than four days old. So we have removed, at this particular point in time, the ability for persons to come to Antigua with an antigen test. And this is an extra measure that we have put in place to ensure that we have the utmost of confidence in the level of security that is provided uh, prior to someone uh, making the determination to come to Antigua. Uh, there is a higher level of confidence that is associated with a PCR test over and above any of the available antigen tests. Uh, but we had, up until last week, um, there was no threat of the Omicron uh, vir uh, variant spread at that point in time when we took that decision. But of course, we're living in a dynamic world with respect to, to COVID, and so we've had to review that position. Uh, all of the other conditions that we had announced last week, uh, we are still unscheduled to, to evaluate those. Uh, the Parliament will meet on the 15th and will make a determination regarding the um, early termination of the state of emergency. Again, that is going to be the outcome of that and the determination of that is going to be determined um, as to what happens globally over the next uh, coming days between now and the 15th. Um, one has to be able to have that type of fleet-footed response to, to these particular issues. But um, all things considered equal, uh, we are still mindful that we would want to lift the state of emergency uh, prior to Christmas. But again, as I'm saying, it depends on the, the global uh, situation with, with respect to 
uh, the spread, and of course, the determination that will be made as to whether or not Omicron, even though it uh, has demonstrated its ability to uh, be, be more infectious, meaning that it spreads easier than any of the prior variants. What one is not sure of at this stage is um, how dangerous it has um, the potential to become in respect of making persons very ill or even leading to um, severe hospitalization cases and even death. Um, so that is still an unknown, and until that determination is made, we have to have a fleet-footed response. Um, as part of the other developments, we, the Minister of Health has confirmed that we have ordered 25,000 antigen tests, which will be made available to uh, the persons who would be organizing our party events uh, during the Christmas celebrations, Christmas and New Year celebrations. And uh, that, uh, we will certainly, we had heard back to the Minister of um, festivals that the promoters um, did in fact welcome the, um, the, the news that the government was prepared to support um, their efforts and they have indicated that rather than do the testing the day before, they are prepared to undertake the tests on the same day. And so that seems to be um, uh, an event well, well met, an opportunity well met. So the, uh, the uh, 25,000 antigen tests are expected to be on island very shortly and um, will be made available to these um, operators at cost. And um, they are of a significant affordable um, rate and um, it's not within the uh, outside of the reach of, of, of persons who would normally go to those types of events. Um, based on the cost that I've seen, it, one of these tests would probably be less than 10 EC dollars. Um, so uh, for the fact that there's been so much compression in terms of persons wanting to have that type of activity, um, an additional $10 on, on the ticket for what many believe to be uh, uh, you know, an opportunity for them to have a good time with friends and family um, would, would not be outside of their reach. Having said that, the uh, rest of the meeting would have been concerned about uh, a very special um, important issue for persons, and that has to do with the availability of portable water by the Public Utilities Authority. Um, the public would be mindful that when we came to office in 2014, Antigua had a dual problem in terms of um, the drought conditions, as well as the fact that there was um, a challenge with one of the major suppliers of water um, to, to, to the APUA and they had an outstanding arrears of some $40 million, which the government had to confront that. We would have put in place in 2016 a new reverse osmosis plant that would have uh, assisted APUA to have availability of more portable water from ground sources and the other aquifers. Um, of course, that proved to be insufficient even as it, even as it was uh, implemented. We have moved further towards restoring or repairing the plant at Friars, and that repair is complete. The plant is just awaiting commissioning um, in, in short order. We have made a determination that we got a gift from the People's Republic of Japan, and uh, that is about to be commissioned as well. But for the hiatus that has taken place with travel, uh, the team from Japan that has to journey here to commission the plant um, they have not yet arrived. Uh, we are using all of the available means to us, including uh, utilizing some of our diplomatic channels to ensure that as quickly as possible, the suppliers and manufacturers of the plant can come to Antigua and to put that plant into commission. Uh, we as well have a development plan for a new 500,000 gallon per day reverse osmosis plant to be located in the Fort James area. And of course, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, installation is going to be pending by the middle of next year. Uh, the middle of next year. Uh, I'm getting my timelines a bit cross. It seems as if I've transferred into 2022 already. But by the middle of next year, we should have the installation of the other plant at uh, Fort James. With the combined effect of <clears throat> the plants that are in the Crabs Peninsula area to include uh, the one at uh, Barnacle Point, the one that is to be commissioned shortly in Bethesda, the one that is also to be commissioned at uh, 
Friars, and of course the one at Fort James, um, AP Way will have the combined effect of approximately 10 million gallons of reverse osmosis um, portable water available for the public of Antigua. The only challenge that remains with the utility company now is to deal with the whole question of distribution. And of course, the rotted pipelines that have been decades old, in fact, perhaps maybe in some instances more than 40 years old, and there is a program to selectively identify and replace uh, these um, rotted pipes. Not only do we want to ensure that there's a constant supply of water, but we want to ensure that when it reaches households, it is in a usable format. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is a, a long protracted issue, and we understand the impatience of many of the members of the public. However, uh, we want to ensure that the, at all material times that the public is kept abreast of these particular changes. Uh, back in 2016, with the aid of uh, state media and, of course, with the aid of, of Mr. Burford, we would have um, developed certain programs to help the public to understand the progress that was being made with respect to the Barnacle Point development. I intend to impose that requirement on state media as well to assist the APOA in communicating as regularly as possible uh, these developments. Uh, the government is mindful of its obligations. Water as a staple for life is a public good, and we want to ensure that everyone um, is uh, supplied with an adequate supply of, in fact, on a 24 by 7, um, not just for residential consumers, but for, for businesses and for, for householders, everyone, um, to be able to ensure that this as a, a common um, requirement, a common resource requirement is available. So the development plans are there, the resources have been made available to APOA. Uh, the government would have, at a later stage last year, in the last quarter of last year, would have supported the APOA in being able to get financing from the Antigua Commercial Bank and a consortium of banks to the tune of approximately $170 million. Um, they have drawn down most of that money to assist with their broadband rollout, which we did receive an update from the telephone manager yesterday. Uh, so we had the team of APOA on board. We have certainly insisted that uh, the public be kept up to date with these developments, and we are doing everything within um, our control to ensure that any uh, hurdles that still remain to be crossed, we will cross them to ensure that in the foreseeable future, in the near future, we will bring an end to the scourge of the, uh, the disruption to the water supply and, of course, to bring clean, portable water to every household and business in Antigua and Barbuda. Um, the other matter that we would have looked at yesterday would have involved an important area of our um, society, and that has to do with the performing arts. Um, one would recall that some two years ago, when the whole question of the demise of the, the, the Luke's um, cinema uh, was, was, was touted, um, it was wrongfully uh, determined by the uh, opposition forces that uh, the government was in fact moving to pull one of its members chestnuts out of the fire. Um, I'm speaking specifically of uh, the member for St. John's Rural North, the, the Honorable uh, Charles Max Fernandez, uh, that his family um, had been owners and operators of the Diluc Cinema Complex for, for a very long time, perhaps maybe since its inception. But the fact remains that the business had um, landed in peril and that the bank was about to foreclose on, on that particular business. And what the government did, in fact, make a determination that the facilities in itself could be uh, repurposed into something that supports the arts. And uh, what we were able to do is to um, overtake, uh, undertake to succeed um, the requirements to meet the obligations to the bank and so that we would have acquired the facility at perilous costs. Um, by that I mean, and, and let me rephrase that, the business was in peril and so the, the uh, facilities then became available at lower than the market value. And that is what the government sought to do, to undertake to meet the obligations to the bank and then acquire the facilities. We are now in a position of repurposing it and under the leadership and the stewardship of our um, High Commissioner to the UK, um, she has been able to um, pull together um, resources from um, other sources within the UK to support the development of the performing arts. 
And of course, accordingly, we have come up with the Antigua Barbie, the youth orchestra and, and symphony operation. It is going to be their home, and we would have received a presentation from the board, the Abiso board, yesterday about the development plans for one portion of that building. And of course, at phase two, we will bring into full operation the, 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 the further redevelopment of the, the Luke Cinema building, and it will become the home of the Antigua Barbie Youth Symphony Orchestra, and of course, uh, a home for the performing arts. And so it is an important development, and we're looking forward to the transformation of that facility in St. John's. I want to leave it there and to avail myself of the questions that you no doubt have from the notes, which gave copious details about our discussions with APU yesterday. And of course, uh, Ambassador Hess and I um, will attempt to answer your questions. Well, thanks to you, Minister Nicholas, and our thanks to Ambassador Hurst. Of course, let me tell you that online, joining us via Skype are my colleagues Nathan Owens from Caribbean Radio Lighthouse, Zoe Carlton from ZDK, and Orville Williams from Observer Media Group. We thank them for joining us. Let's actually start off with my colleagues on Skype. And this morning, for a change, we'll start with Nathan Owens, who normally is uh, uh, on the back end, but uh, we'll start with him to open the batting this morning. Nathan, over to you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, good, good morning, Nathan. I think you are the Courtney Walsh of the uh, <laughs> of your 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 bat in the night watchman's position. But welcome. Yes, caught, caught me off guard. Not my usual position. Yes, uh, Minister. The most recently published Gazette amended the paragraph that states that every business owner having five or more employees shall mandate that their employees be vaccinated to include unless the business has an 80% or higher rate of vaccination among the employees. If the private business has 80% or more vaccinated employees, can they still require the employees to be vaccinated? Um, I imagine that he can still encourage them to, to be vaccinated. With the, the, the mandate itself, um, was the device used to ensure that we had the optimal amount of um, subscription to the vaccines. And uh, the restriction that were placed on persons who were unvaccinated um, did in fact um, have an effect and impact in the private sector. So the question would be, um, it would not be, the, the mandates go as far as to ensure that we got to the 80%. So if they're at 80%, there will be no further re restriction uh, placed on that business to demand or to impose any further uh, restraint on those persons who are unvaccinated. Which is to say, as of 1st of December, as of two days ago, um, if a business was already at the 80% criteria, then all that would be required were for the remaining unvaccinated persons to submit to a regime of uh, testing every two weeks. So that requirement for testing for unvaccinated persons, even in an environment where the businesses or the public is already at the 80% percentile level, um, still continues, and it is still a requirement for them to be tested every two weeks, at, at their cost, of course. And is that a law, or that's, is the government saying they have to be tested every two weeks, or that's the employer saying that in the private sector? The government is saying that. Okay. All right. One other question along those same lines. Can an a private employer terminate employment based on vaccination status, regardless of the percentage of vaccinated in their employment? Uh, the requirement for that would be, uh, I could see a condition that would lead to termination. And uh, let's assume for a moment that uh, an individual determines that they would not want to be vaccinated. And of course, the business is under the, uh, business is under the, the, the uh, the guidelines of the, the regulations, the public health advisory that requires that the business ensure that there is compliance either in terms of vaccination or testing, and an employee makes a determination that they would not um, adhere to either of those requirements, or both of them, they will not be vaccinated and they will not be tested. I think in such circumstances that um, the employee would make a determination that they no longer want to be employed by the firm because the firm has a legal obligation um, to adhere to the uh, requirements of the public health advisory. So in those circumstances, I imagine, and um, we think that there is sufficient um, scope 
and, and latitude that there may be no, there will be no need for that type of determination. But that's the only situation I could think of offhand. Um, and of course, there's a lot of gray area between black and white uh, in these matters, but I think automatically that, quite, that, that situation is what presents itself as would be cause for just termination. But um, one would hope that good sense will prevail in all circumstances and there will be no need for that. Thank you. One final question. Is the government satisfied that the protocols in relation to only vaccinated individuals visiting restaurants for dine-in are being followed? Uh, we have received a number of uh, whistleblower information that uh, there are several restaurants, um, not many, that are not making it a requirement for entry and for seating. And we have turned those information over to the Ministry of Health such that the necessary follow-up can be done. But by and large, yes, the regulations seem to be working accordingly. Thank you, Minister. And Garfield, thank you for the reminder to always be ready. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Gertie Loins. Uh, let's go over now to uh, Zoe Carlton, uh, second in the batting order, coming at number three. Over to you, Zoe. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Zoe. Uh, now, I have a follow-up to... Uh, um, and this is to do with religious grounds as well. Now, um, it says quite clearly in the notes, that private sectors decide what rules govern their premises. So if they do not want to have an unvaccinated member of staff, it is within their, their remit to say, I do not want you to work here unless you are vaccinated. Is that the case, please? Yes, there is no uh, obligation legally, and, and that's imposed on the business, that uh, they have to uh, stop at 80%. Uh, they may Brilliant. make a determination that the safe environment that they wish to provide for the rest of their employees and for their uh, uh, patrons that they may want to uh, make a determination that uh, this is an our requirement for work and uh, these are matters that I'm sure will get tested in the courts on occasions but uh, businesses make these determinations and the government is not intended to take over the operation of the business. What we are in, interested in seeing is that uh, from a public standpoint that the public health um, emergency that we are faced with uh, that there is a contribution made by each and every unit of society, um, and that includes businesses as well. Thank you, sir, because I know businesses have gone to a lot of trouble and expense to make sure their staff are vaccinated. Thank you very much for that. And a question that I've been asked to ask a couple of times is, uh, on what grounds can people have religious exemption? And on what grounds do the Rastafarians, why are they allowed to have religious exemption? Well, yes, this matter came up um, in great detail yesterday when we were visited by a member of the, uh, the cloth who um, had indicated publicly that he had some concerns that he wished to address in cabinet. And so we met with a member of uh, Kingdom, I think it's uh, Kingdom Ministries, um, yes. Kingdom Ministries Ambassador, um, and uh, the whole question as to what is the criteria. Uh, there had to be, uh, prior to this whole COVID event, that there had to be some religious um, um, teaching or instruction um, with respect to uh, issues like vaccinations and uh, that type of medical procedure. We know, for example, that the Jehovah Witnesses um, in particular um, have practiced for eons this whole idea that they are against um, issues like blood transfusions. That's an issue that has been well known to the Jehovah Witness faith and, and their doctrine. And uh, similarly, um, there have been issues in relation to uh, natural treatments on behalf of, uh, certainly in the Rastafari community. And that those conditions existed prior to uh, the, the whole question of, um, uh, of, of the mandates. And so the regulations, the religious exemption, does look to those type of conditions and uh, the religious organizations um, um, would, 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 would be required to submit where in their doctrine that uh, these, these, these types of, of, of uh, changes or these types of um, procedures would have been precluded as a matter of their faith. And so it does shy away from the whole issue of personal um, religious beliefs that people have, and it has to be a matter of doctrine 
of the religious organization. And so I think that that brings into focus why it is that the regulations does appear, or the exemption does appear to favor the Rastafari more than any other um, uh, particular religious sect in the society. Um, and, and, and that was really what came out of the discussion with um, Bishop Brown yesterday and, and Kingdom Ministries. So, and again, a private sector, it's a private business, it is their discretion whether they accept this, is it? Uh, well, we had published certain guidelines um, when we imposed these requirements on the, the public sector workers. And uh, while we could not impose any of those guidelines on businesses, uh, they were there as guidelines. And if they made a determination that the guidelines were sound and they wanted to use that as a measure um, and as the, um, the basis for making their own determinations, um, we welcome that. Thank you very much, sir. Um, one other question, I'm afraid it's still COVID-based. We, we, the Omicron at the moment is very much unknown. We believe it's benign. This obviously, this is, viruses are going to mutate. But um, is this the right time to be relaxing the mandate rules, do you think? Again, as I've indicated, there is time between now and the 15th when the parliament would make a final determination. Um, from a policy standpoint, we have indicated that we are satisfied that based on um, the uh, security mechanisms that we have put in place for persons to enter Antigua uh, with respect to our travel advisories, um, what we would have done at Port Health at uh, the points of entry, um, what we would have done in terms of all of the, the social distancing and the guidelines that we put in place and the restrictions, the levels of vaccination that we have in the population, we are satisfied that we are going to have to live with COVID. We are not going to be able to live in an adjusted environment um, and continue to do harm to ourselves economically and which will have social impacts and, 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 and implications. So we have made a determination that based on the responses that we have received to the uh, mandates that we would have achieved a degree of uh, compliance in a number of instances. And uh, while we accept that there will be instances where there will be increases in the number of persons um, coming down with an infection that uh, we, the dividend that we expect from all of the work that we have done prior is that we will have less persons, excuse me, being hospitalized, far fewer having to go on ventilators. And certainly we will bring this issue on the management. So we have enough vaccines on island. Um, as you can see, we have just uh, move to import a further 10,000 uh, reagents uh, tests that will allow us to be able to make those types of early determinations and detections. We have beefed up the resources of our um, contact tracing team. There are now an additional 20 members added. So all of the resources that would give us the opportunity to manage in this dynamic environment are in play. And clearly, we want to get to that position. We are having now reopened up the economy. We have begun to see some new sprouts in terms of tourism. Uh, we are receiving <clears throat> some um, expression of interest, even friction um, in the cruise tourism sector by taxi drivers and tour operators asking for their early reward for the services that they're providing. This is, this is what we want. And uh, to remain crippled because of um, you know, the fear of the further spread of COVID. Um, I believe that within, you know, the foreseeable future, even though I am vaccinated and I'm likely to get, uh, to avail myself of a, a booster shot when it becomes available, that it is likely that I will come in contact with the virus at one point in time or the other. And um, I may have a mild sickness. Um, and so it is, and to that extent, um, I feel relatively secure. I'm not not invincible, but I feel relatively secure, more secure than I was a year ago. And so we have taken that decision to reopen the country. However, between now and the 15th, if more information comes to hand to suggest that Omicron, not only does it spread faster, but is even more dangerous than any of its previous variants, um, then we may have to uh, make those um, determinations at that point in time, but we're not there yet. And if it turns out that it is perhaps maybe a faster spreader, but it is probably more innocuous than the previous versions, 
then we really would not have anything to worry about and we've, we will be in a position to proceed onwards with the, the type of uh, opening up of the society that we wanted to do. Thank you. So if I actually may ask just one more very quick question, give me Orville. Um, with all this weather, the hot weather, the still weather, the mosquitoes have come out en masse. Are there any plans to start fogging again in the near future, please? This is an ongoing requirement for the uh, Central Board of Health. Uh, as you would imagine, their workload would have uh, increased manifold because of the additional regulatory supervision that they have to do with respect to the public health. Uh, but I'm sure the Chief Health Inspector, um, she's very attentive to these uh, matters and I'm sure that she has heard your concern. Uh, whether or not uh, there will be um, an increased level of, of fogging, um, I think what can happen sometimes is members of society, members of the community with the community spirit can assist this as well to ensure that there are no uh, you know, unnecessary um, situations where water gathers in utensils and that creates an environment for, for the mosquito larvae to populate and, and, to, and, and to spread. But, but certainly it is an ongoing requirement for the Central Board of Health and um, whether or not she's listening or not, I will be prepared to give us some feedback from this morning's proceedings and indicate that it has come. Right. Clearly this is a matter that's of immediate interest for me as well because there is a water system that courses through my constituency and it is covered with, in many occasions, there are lots of ponds um, within that um, drainage system with, with vegetation that creates an environment for the spread of mosquito and mosquito-borne illnesses as well. So it's an appropriate call and I will certainly um, avail myself of the opportunity to notify Ms. Sharon Martin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Orville and Garfield. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks as well to you, Zoe Carlton from ZDK. Let's go over now finally to Orville Williams at uh, Observer Media Group. Good morning, Orville. Your questions, please. Good morning, Garfield. Thank you. Morning, Minister. Morning, Ambassador. Good Hurst. morning, Orville. My first question this morning is, um, is on the, the, the threat of the new Omicron variant. The government has repeatedly you know, insisted that the Public Health Act gives it the power to, to sufficiently protect the population by putting the necessary measures in place, you know, against COVID-19. So th despite the threat of this new variant, it, it could the planned lifting of the state of emergency not go ahead, you know, without being altered, but the Public Health Act being used to, to protect the population from the Omicron, if necessary? Yes, it's a, it's a good question. And let me be clear again. The removal of the state of emergency, the immediate impact of the removal of the state of emergency would bring an end to the curfew conditions. Uh, and when both those regulations, the state of emergency, which again first came into being by uh, an order from the Governor General, the declaration from the Governor General, followed within a seven day period by the Act of Parliament and uh, the renewal, the subsequent renewal um, of the state of emergency. In those instances, and, and since last year, March, what we had <clears throat> was a requirement um, as part of the management of, of, of bringing COVID under control um, was to restrict movement of persons. And the movement of persons, the free movement of persons, is a, a right enjoyed by many constitutionally, by all. It's a constitutional right, a freedom of movement. And so in order for us to curtail movement, we had to have that particular caveat of the implementation of a state of emergency. Um, where we are today with respect to, um, and of course that was complemented by some of the other public health measures. It's a, a nuance that was misunderstood. Uh, uh, either it was misunderstood or it was deliberately uh, misconstrued by our opposition in parliament to indicate that it was an unnecessary act and it was an unnecessary restriction of freedom. Um, clearly, uh, they did not um, have the, the vision or the wisdom to understand that it was um, all of those measures that we had to use to manage COVID. Um, I believe in, in the earlier part of the summer when we had the numbers shoot up to, to near 1,000, uh, beyond 1,000 persons, uh, I was asked on this panel whether or not the restriction um, and, and the COVID moving the, the, the uh, COVID numbers back down to 8 p.m. in the evening, whether or not those were effective. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I've I had indicated that on all previous occasions when we have used um, the slowing down of, of, of persons 
and the restriction of movement. It had actually, in fact, helped. Where we are today with um, at least 60% of the population being fully vaccinated and uh, all of the measures that we have known and the continued restrictions that we have put in place under the, um, the, the Public Health Act, um, we are satisfied that the Public Health Act with the restrictions that it allows us to continue to put in place, um, we can manage the outcome that we, 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 we want without necessarily having to restrict persons. However, and I did point out, if circumstances would change in the new year, the government still has the option of seeking to um, cause the governor general in the first instance and then beyond that the parliament to reinstitute a state of emergency if the situation gets out of hand. Um, but we don't think that we're going to be in that position. We believe that we have um, sufficient good um, sense in the society to know um, what we need to do. And if we continue to make it a requirement that we wear masks publicly, especially when we're in um, you know, social gatherings, especially in enclosed environments, and we continue to do all of those other measures, it almost become uh, a regular state of affair that you're entering a business and you have to do the sanitary checks. Uh, businesses have been good, so even though sometimes people nonchalantly go past the checks, there is a security officer to bring you back to bear. I've seen it happen at the supermarkets and other places of business. If we continue to do those, and uh, the availability of vaccines in the population, and the availability of testing, and particularly that we're gonna make them so much more affordable, if we continue to do those, and the fact that the Ministry of Health um, contact tracing team has been fortified in the way that it has, um, we are satisfied that we, we have done well in terms of management. And on this occasion, uh, let me just speak to an issue that I know may come up, um, or the whole question of the vaccine cards. By far and away, Antigua is way out in front in terms of utilizing the vaccine IDs as a measure of controlling uh, the spread of COVID. Um, it's the only card that I possibly know, perhaps maybe Trinidad is in tow, that has the ability to give anyone who would require the opportunity to inspect the vaccination status of a person who carries one of these cards. Uh, the QR code allows for automatic um, electronic verification of the status of, of the, the card bearer. Um, and it has been uh, acclaimed everywhere that Antiguans and citizens of residents have traveled from as far away as Dubai and other parts of Europe where um, persons who have traveled with it have produced it to indicate their vaccination status, it has been heralded. And so we have done many, many things by and of ourselves to have made the management of COVID something that we feel confident that if we continue to pay attention, that we should be able to manage the outcomes. But the caution here is, is that if over the next week and a half, um, the conditions that will prevail upon us and that will prevail upon um, the, the, you know, the global environment that Omicron does prove to be um, dangerously harmful, um, then we may have to revert to some other stringent measures to be able to manage the outcomes that we desire. But at this stage, we believe that we have COVID under sufficient management that we can relax the curfew conditions and remove the state of emergency. Thank you, Minister. My next question is on the, um, the return of the government employees to work and specifically the, the cap on testing uh, at 100 uh, employees per day. I know that you know, the, the stance of the government is encouraging vaccinations and not trying to appease those who are you know, anti-vax or not supporting the, the, the wider um, effort toward you know, herd immunity and, and widespread vaccinations. But can that 100 per day capacity not you know, just be increased to, to avoid any displacement, you know, considering the financial hardship that people have been facing for the better part of 20 months? I think it becomes a scheduling issue rather than one that is going to impose hardships. Um, it would mean if we can only manfully do 100 per day, it would mean that perhaps maybe there have to be, um, you know, if, if the numbers in the public service are, are beyond a manageable amount on a particular day. It will mean that instead of going on a Monday, you will probably go on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Um, I don't think it is, it's designed that it's gonna create any particular financial hardship. It's more a question of scheduling. Uh, just as, as an example, um, here at ABS, I'm aware that we have 
100% um, compliance with the vaccine in the entire ministry, of which there are approximately uh, upwards of nearly 200 employees. There are only three persons who, on the 1st of December, are not vaccinated in my ministry. Um, so the numbers are manageable in a number of instances. In some ministries, it's, it's a little different. Um, but those persons are going to be given the opportunity to have scheduled days when they can do their tests on a, on a two-weekly um, cycle. So it is not designed for hardship. It is designed that it has to be based on the reality of the resources that are available at the clinics to be able to administer these tests. And don't forget that public servants have the option of getting these tests free of cost until the end of the year. In the new year, there will be a nominal charge. There is likely to be a nominal charge associated with these tests. Going forward. Right, sorry, the Minister, the reason I asked is the note specifically says, um, or say rather, that the workers cannot go back until they're tested. Um, so, so, so my question, I assume that they would not be paid for the days that they might miss by not being tested. So that's why I asked that. Well, I mean, if you think of it, um, for 1st of December, if they had that, um, gone out to receive the test. Yes, they would not be required um, to, to come out to work, and clearly that absence will be caused by themselves. These regulations were published weeks ago, and uh, so if you do not have the test to show up to work on the 1st of December or the 2nd or the 3rd of December, that's in you, but that will only be in, in the first one-off instance. Uh, but subsequent to that, and you do come out to work, you would be aware that every two weeks you'll be required to do it. So I don't see that being something that um, creates hardship. It's a question of understanding the schedule and the obligation that each person has to get tested. All right, so I have another question on the Omicron variant. Can you say whether the health ministry has the capacity now to test for that variant? And if not, are there concerns about the, um, how the strain that will likely befall CAFA to support the rest of the region might impact Antigua and Barbuda? The Ministry of Health had asked for some resources early this year for them to be able to do some genetic sequencing. I'm not sure that we have completed that cycle, um, but to the extent that they are unable to make that determination to do their genetic sequencing to be able to determine uh, whether or not we, um, our samples as retrieved from persons who come forward to be tested, um, whether or not um, we can do it ourselves, or we're going to have to rely on the services of CAFA. Um, CAFA has been a good supporting and enabling partner in our fight against COVID. So we will avail ourselves of the resources of CAFA or perhaps maybe any other country in, in CARICOM who has that ability. And I, I think when we made a determination that we had upwards of 50% of the samples, 60% of the samples that were of the, the Delta variant, um, it was through the instrumentality of CAFA that we got um, that help. Um, and I believe Dr. Simon would have indicated that as we were sending them samples, um, based on um, the discovery that he made, belatedly, of course, but not through any fault of his own, that um, CAFA was able to help us with the determination that the Delta variant was in fact present in Antigua. The same would apply with Omicron. Um, and clearly, we have, um, you know, eyes peeled back for these type of eventualities. Um, it was only yesterday that. I think um, the United States made a determination that um, their tests have revealed that there was at least one person in California who had the Omicron. And it, it, these things are going to sometimes come as delayed information. But we have the support and the assistance of CAFA in these, in these matters. And of course, as I've indicated, the Ministry of Health did come forward and ask for the additional um, support from the government to be able to allow them to be able to do some um, genetic sequencing as well to make some of these determinations themselves. I'm not aware of how far that development has gone, but it's certainly the intention of the, the Ministry of Health and certainly the laboratory at the Mount St. John Medical Center. Celeste Bird, Mount St. John Center, Medical Center, sorry. All right, thank you very much, Minister. You're welcome. All right, thank you so much as well, uh, Orville. Uh, Orville there with uh, uh, Observer Media Group. Minister, a few quick questions for me. Let's remind our audiences, especially on radio and online platforms, as we indicated at the start of the program, that uh, normally sports speed comes up between 9 and 10 o'clock. It will follow immediately these proceedings this morning on ABS Radio and or Facebook Live platform. Uh, Minister, will booster shots, uh, the CMO and the Minister for Health <coughs> indicated that booster shots will be rolled out starting this week. 
starting with frontline uh, health workers, uh, will booster shots generally be used to determine or to be factored into the equation for full vaccination? Will you need that to be, deter to be classified as being fully vaccinated? At this stage, no. Uh, a fully vaccinated person would have completed in the initial phase a full dosage of any one of the vaccines that we have available. And there is only one uh, vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson, that uh, would qualify you as being fully vaccinated with a single dose. But once you have completed dual doses of any one of the other vaccines, then you're considered fully vaccinated. Uh, the good thing about the cards that we are carrying, once you get a booster shot and it is uploaded into the medical record, uh, once the card is scanned, um, without having um, to go back and get the card reprinted, even though it will show that you're fully vaccinated with two doses, in the profile that will be uh, available upon inspection, it will show when, in fact, you have received a booster. So the record, the medical record that will be available from an inspection of the card will indicate that you have not only dual doses of one of the other vaccines, but you also have a booster shot as well. But it is not going to be a requirement for determination of your full vaccination status. Mm, okay, well, thanks for that, Minister, on that. Uh, in terms of the vaccination card backlog, has that been fully cleared now? It has been cleared. Uh, the manager would have reported to me the day before yesterday, and I would have uh, reported to Cabinet that um, there were less than 500 cards now to be collected. Uh, when I first reported it to the media, and I indicated that it was approximately 2,500 cards, obviously um, I did not have a full count, and the number had in fact exceeded um, 3,500 cards. Um, they have since been able to uh, contact most of the persons and they have been able to deplete that backlog by upwards of 500 per day. Um, I believe when the manager and I spoke last evening um, that there are less than 200 cards away now from clearing all of the backlogs and they are back on full production cycles. So um, I would expect that the cards are going to be an issue that is, 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 is going to be freer. I also have indicated to the cabinet that I would expect uh, both the manager and the IT personnel from the Celeste Bird Medical Center to have an engagement with the press um, to notify that the process changes that are available. Uh, clearly there are two streams, persons who are not technology savvy and cannot apply for the cards um, online through the email process, as well as uh, there are persons who, are, as I say, would prefer to go in in person. So there are two streams, and uh, we're going to ask state media to assist us as well in um, presenting the information of how either can be done. Um, we have added an additional email to allow persons to be able to uh, put out a trace for their card. So if they have applied for it and they have not heard back from the card center in an um, appreciable time, then they can send a further query into the trace cards. And that will be able to allow the teams to be able to trace and identify the card and to complete the cycle as quickly as possible. I'm looking forward to the process improvement. Um, I've indicated to the team that they have a long way to go. There are over 22,000 cards that are in the hands of persons now. Um, we've come a long way from since we um, doubled the capacity. Um, so more than 22,000 persons. I imagine by the end of next week, we'll be closer to 30,000 persons who will have the cards. But given that we're looking at um, a hilltop of about 65,000 persons in the next coming weeks, we are only halfway through the process. So it's, it's a long slog, and um, as we continue to improve the process, we want to give the public um, the assurance that every possible effort is being given to improve the way we do business with you. Um, yesterday we had uh, another event at the Multipurpose Center where I understand that the water pumps had, um, mis um, had malfunctioned to the point where um, the center had to be closed for sanitary reasons, um, but I imagine that it will be back to full operations this morning. But that apart, um, everything is on course to ensure that the cards are going to be available and demand going forward, certainly into the new week. Okay, thanks for that update, Minister. Just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, a viewer who is away, who is outside of this country, uh, indicated that uh, she had applied uh, for the VAX card by sending an email with all the required documentation. Uh, she did that about three weeks now, not even a reply to say the info was received and it's been worked on. And she's asking, who do I call or which department is responsible so I can do a follow-up? I just ask the person that. to leave some contact information and I will certainly give her the contact information after the fact so that they can um, do the necessary trace for her. 
Okay, thanks for that, Minister. Very, uh, very quick final question on this, and this is from another viewer uh, who wrote to the question through our colleague Shelton Daniel. Uh, what document is required for a Rastafarian who wishes to travel abroad to return home? Is there anything in place for private sector or self-employed exempted Rastafari? Well, uh, let me first of all say that uh, for in order for a person to travel, the governing uh, re requirement regulation is going to be imposed upon them by the country that they wish to visit. So if, for example, uh, there is a requirement to get into the UK, uh, that there is a requirement to enter the UK, those requirements are not determined by any of the regulations that we make. So persons who are unvaccinated, who are Rastafari for any other reason, um, have determined that they do not want to be vaccinated, then they themselves have um, restricted their own movement by virtue of the fact that almost universally countries require per persons to be vaccinated. So um, that's the advice that I would have to give if there really has to be uh, travel, um, save and accept the, 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 the receiving country is prepared to accept for medical emergencies or, or that like um, exemptions, then of course um, the persons are going to be restricted based on those um, exigencies in those countries, but we are not the ones to make those determinations. So to the Rastafari brethren, our sistren, um, if you are not vaccinated and you want to travel for a country that requires vaccination um, prior to entry, there's nothing that we can do about it. You will not be able to attend to that country. Okay, all right. This is a final, but any update on minutes on Liat in terms of whether or not the workers, uh, the representatives of the workers, the unions have accepted the government's offer for 50 percent? A compassionate offer? Uh, given DPM was central to that discussion, uh, we did not have any further discussion in that at Cabinet yesterday in his absence, but to the best of my knowledge, it's, it's the status quo had remained. The, the government is fairly locked in, in its position that uh, we, we have made a goodwill gesture, and um, there are some questions in that have come out um, in relation to uh, the issues of if the land issue becomes an issue for persons outside of Antigua who may want to access that benefit, whether or not we will consider waiving some of the other license requirements for um, ownership of land in Antigua, et cetera. Those are matters that will come out in the wash and um, the goodwill of the government transposes itself on all of the, the offers that have been made. So whether it's in the form of cash, bond, or other land, um, the intention is not to impose any further hardship what we want to do is to be able to get those persons' lives readjusted and, of course, to get Liat back into a position where it can resume the services, the necessary services to the region, as it has done so well over the last um, decades, the last several decades. Thanks for that. Update Minister, back over to yourself and Ambassador Hurst to wrap things up this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Buffett. One item which I attempted to add this morning and <coughs> I was certain had been included, but I noticed and that in the printed version before me that uh, it is excluded. And that is a plea by Minister Darrell Matthew, the minister responsible for sports, to have um, a sum of money uh, allocated by cabinet to assist Mr. Aldo McCoy, who is a sports administrator and who has been terribly ill. And so uh, the cabinet took into account uh, the role which he has played in sports and other kinds of uh, social indicators. And uh, have, uh, the cabinet has outstretched its arm uh, to provide him with uh, a certain assistance. And uh, I think Minister Matthew will uh, communicate that assistance directly to him. But I wanted it to be known that it, it ought to have been included in our cabinet notes, uh, our cabinet report uh, this morning. Let me also add something that is not in the cabinet and that was not uh, uh, a discussion, but today's HIV AIDS Day and uh, International HIV AIDS Day and I yesterday. Know, uh, yesterday. yesterday and, and um, the, uh, I, I know that the HIV secretariat here uh, wants everyone to know his or her status, especially those of us um, who uh, may have um, relations with others. <laughs> so, let me encourage uh, your listeners, your um, viewers, and so on, to go check their status. Huh? It's a very important act. I, too, will be doing that. All right. With that having been said, we know that the minister always has the, uh, the last word. Uh, so, Minister Nicholas, back over to you. Sure. And uh, 
I would just want to as well point out, I did not do it at the start of the discussion, but there are notes are available to you to indicate that the Minister of Health as well did uh, give an indication that uh, there are some common developments with respect to the um, public health services to include uh, the development and rollout of the um, cardiac center. Uh, we are in discussion with a very important global partner um, to assist us in developing the uh, cardiac center, and that will complement the renal center as well. And so we'll be able to improve the complement of health services at a tertiary level here in Antigua and Barbuda. And this, of course, comes as well with the promise that in the not too distant future, we will have full um, health insurance scheme for everyone to ensure that um, a, 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 almost a full panel of uh, health services will be available to the uh, citizens and residents of Antigua um, through the public health facilities. So these are some important developments, and I'm sure at the appropriate time, the Minister of Health will come to the public as he's want to do, and to give a full disclosure of these developments. But there are some notes that teases you in that respect to be able to avail yourselves of, of these developments when in fact they do occur. I want to take this opportunity as well to thank you all for being here with us again this morning, and we look forward to our continued uh, engagement with you in the, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, I'd just like to as well um, indicate that this morning we had a late start, and um, I'd like to apologize for the late start. And I know that it was keenly anticipated uh, by, by many members of the public, many of whom would have messaged me on the phone to ask what of the press briefing this morning. So there was a delay this morning, and uh, we'd want to apologize for that. But thank you all for being with us, and look forward to being with you next week. Excellent. Thank you so, so much as well, Minister Nicholas. Minister Nicholas is Minister for Information Broadcasting, Telecommunications and Information Technology, and Ambassador Lionel Hurst is the Chief of Staff in the Prime Minister's office. We thank our colleagues who joined us on Skype this morning, Nathan Owens from Caribbean Radio Lighthouse, who was still a little shocked that he opened the batting this morning. Zoe Carlton, who came in at number three, and Orville Williams uh, from Observer Media, who came in as the number 11 batsman today. We really appreciate your company. Of course, joining us uh, uh, in, on radio and our online platforms now will be Cherie Sargent and Akila Hillhouse with Sports Beat. Look out for that. Please do join and participate in that newest and most exciting program on ABS. Until then, good morning.